has to be something where there's real family outside your some of you need a different bloodline some of you need a different bloodline because the bloodline you've had in your family doesn't work some of you come from a great family some of you come from a great bloodline but some of you need to be attached to a different bloodline and this is the place where god can spiritually change the bloodline of your life where you become a part of the heir of the kingdom of grace you become to be a part of the kingdom of uh, the kingdom culture and Jesus's family and the lineage of his blessing and become a son of David, right? Like Jesus, you become a son of the house. You become a son of God's promises over generations. And you get tied into that. And it's so important that we're attached properly to that. So Elijah prayed or uh, prayed over Elisha and he gave him a mantle. And to put that in perspective, um, in, in the Old Testament, so maybe you hear something like, oh, they carry such a big mantle. And you, a mantle in the Old Testament, what a mantle was is Elijah in, in particular, he had a leather mantle. It was like, the best way to put it is like a cloak or a coat, okay? And coats signified identity. Joseph was given a coat of many colors. That's why his brothers were so upset. They're like, oh, he, he has a favored coat. So rings, coats, shoes were a sign of belonging. They were signs you belonged to something. You didn't just wear, there was no such thing as like rings for jewelry. That wasn't really, I mean, there was, but there, that wasn't what it was for. When you had a ring, it was called a signet ring. It's what you used to seal things and prove that you, you were who was writing the letter. It would be sealed with your signature, your signet ring. They didn't have signature verification back then. Your ring that you put into clay or, or wax or something like that, that sealed it. So when you're given a ring, it says you're a part of this house. You're a part of the authority attached to this ring. And so the coat was the same thing. You wear a coat. They, they cast lots for Jesus' coat. They wanted to carry his authority. We're going to have the coat of Jesus. And so they cast lots. So Elijah took his leather jacket. See, he, dude, that dude was awesome. He's out there with his leather coat on, just calling down fire and stuff. I'm like, in 2020, I had the leather coat of Lonnie Frisbee laid on me. And I'm like, this is what Elijah felt like. This is what Elisha felt like when Elijah laid the leather coat on. So he had a leather coat and he carried it. And it wasn't like a coat, but it was like, and, and there's a point where he takes the, the mantle of Elish, Elijah and Elisha takes it and strikes the water with it and the water parts. And he walks across it and everyone's like, oh, he's got Elijah's anointing. He's got his mantle, and he's demonstrating his authority. And it actually says that Elisha did twice as much, twice as many miracles than Elijah did. Elijah's the father. Elijah's the great one. But Elisha actually does twice as much. But he has the mantle of Elijah on him. He has what he carries and what his father carried. He has the spiritual inheritance of what God called in the beginning, where he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And Elisha has multiplied. He's taken his own mantle, his own giftings, and he's carrying the mantle of his father. Now, he already had giftings that Elijah had given him. He had already been taught, trained, and equipped. He already carried, I was trained by Elijah. You were trained by, I went to a school of the prophets. I graduated. You know, they went around, and, and he went to other, the school of the prophets, and they all said, your, your master's about to be taken today. Elijah had more than one person he trained, but there was only one he mantled. And so he makes him the carrier of his ministry and he puts a coat on him that says, you carry what I carry and he's given a mantle of authority. And so all of us have our own mantle. All of us have something that God has given us. All of us have an identity that God has given us and he'll put a coat on us that says, this is what you carry for me. But what happens is when you come into family relationship is that we're able to wear, we get a new coat, something comes on us. Here's the problem that happens is that we're so desperate for identity that we'll take anyone's coat if it looks fancy enough, if it looks pretty enough. Oh man, mine doesn't look as fancy as that one. That's a way better coat. I want his coat. And there are seasons where we come into relationships. See, I already had my own clothing, but now I'm wearing somebody else's coat. But I decide I want everyone's coat. 
Now, I want giftings. I want impartation from every man, woman of God, but I am not called to be in covenant with every one of them. I am not called to wear the family coat of everyone. There is a coat I'm meant to wear. And so what happens is we get so desperate for identity. We want to look like something. We want to look like somebody that will look like anybody because we see everyone's great. Can I say something to you before I do this? Let me say something to you. God will call you to a people and those people won't always have great days. Those people will not always be on their best behavior. In fact, I won't always be on your best, my best behavior. Sometimes I'll upset you. I will. Here's the reality. If you're my son or my daughter, I'm willing to, to upset you. I'm willing to get in your face and say, knock it off. Ooh, I will like you right now. Come on, any parents in the room hear that before? If you're my spiritual son or daughter, I don't need you to like me. I need you to look like me. I need you to turn into something. I need you to look like something. I'm trying to turn you into something. I'm trying to grow you up into something powerful. I'm trying to pour into you. I don't need you to like me. I need you to look like me. You don't need a father that's perfect. You need a father that's anointed, that has something to pour on your life. So you say, ooh, I'm going to take that coat. Well, what happens is we step into a new season. You say, I want the coat of the new season. It still fits. Kind of. I got me a new coat. But see, I'm, I'm still wearing last season's coat, but I got a new coat. And maybe I got the mantle I carry. And maybe I got the mantle of my father, and I, it kind of fits me. But what happens is, is I just keep ha being hungry for more. I want everyone's mantle. I want everyone's anointing. I want everyone's everything. And I start chasing after that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with saying I want a gift. There's nothing wrong with saying I want a gift. I want an impartation. We should seek after impartation, impartation. Man, when a, a, God, a, a man of God comes in this house, a woman of God, and they're carrying something on their life, I'm like, pray for me. Leave something on my life. Drip some oil on my life. But I know that I don't need to wear every one of their coat. I'm not all of a sudden like, I'm going to follow you. There are so many Christians, what they'll do, they'll bounce from one uh, star-struck pastor to another, with this ministry to that ministry to this ministry, because they're like, ooh, you're anointed. And then they'll get in deep enough to realize those people are humans, and then they're disenfranchised with them. And so they move on to the next big ministry, and they just move from big ministry to big ministry so they can post on Facebook about what cool big ministry they're now learning from. I see that all the time. And they're like, I'm here at this, I won't name them, I'm here at this big ministry. I'm like, good for you. Are you a daughter or you just show up? Because I don't know if you know this, but they let everyone in the door. So it's like you're, you're, just because you go there doesn't make you a son or daughter. You don't carry the name of the house. You don't represent them. If you were to act crazy and I call up your, that pastor and say, hey, what's up? What's up? What's up with Linda? She's acting crazy. Linda's acting crazy. I was like, she goes to your church. This is on you. No, it is not on me. She sits on the 17th row. I, I, I've talked to her all at once in my church. She didn't carry my name, my identity. I have not raised her up. I have not authorized her, elevated her, put her in leadership. People will come into a church and be like, man, I had a weird encounter with that person on the 17th row. So what? And so we'll wear you the wrong coat. So then what happens is we finally have an, Elite, uh, an Elijah show up in our life. And he's got the leather coat we were meant to carry. And he says, come with me, I'll make you supernatural. And he says, I'm going to put something on you that you carry, and you're going to carry my identity on you. You're going to carry my supernatural authority. You're going to carry the power that I carry on you, but it's going to come on you double, and I'm going to give you my coat. And you say, come on, okay? So what happens is, is you're carrying, you got the coat, but you can't wear it right it fits you. But what you want to do is add and never want God to strip anything out of your life. You're still carrying the hurt of the previous ministry that you are still tied to. You are still wearing that coat even though you have left and you are hurt. You are still trying to carry that authority. You're still trying to carry their doctrine, their belief systems, and their environment, and their culture, and be attached to things that you are not attached to anymore. And the coat that God wants to put on you, the authority that you're meant to walk in, you can't fully wear. So you always feel uncomfortable in the environment. You feel uncomfortable in the clothes you're wearing because you can't properly wear it. And you go, you know what? I'm just not totally comfortable here. I would submit to you, but I'm not comfortable with you being a spiritual father because I've been through some stuff. You're still wearing the coat of the previous commission you're under. And here's the reality is that the Bible says, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, if you want to carry my coat, if you want me to put a coat of righteousness on you, you need to die to yourself. You need to be stripped first. Some of you can't carry the calling on your life because you won't start stripping. But this one looks so fancy, God. I didn't call you to that season. I didn't call you to that people. That's the one you wanted to carry because you thought it was impressive. 
You thought that looked really good. And so you wanted to be attached to that fancy name, that big ministry, that big thing. And I never called you to that, but you put it on anyways. The one I called you to actual has real authority, but you can't wear it. And you're still wearing the identity of a previous generation over your life. And what you don't realize is God wants to walk you into a new season and you need to start taking off the old mantle. You can carry the giftings without being under that mantle anymore and saying, this is not who I am. I don't have a healing ministry. See, when I first started walking in the authority God gave me, I said, Lord, am I, do I have a healing ministry? I kept asking, well, I see healing, so I must have a healing ministry. I kept asking for what my specific ministry was, and I didn't understand it why God would take me into different seasons where I prophesied. Well, I must be, am I a prophet? Do I have a prophetic ministry? And I kept asking, well, God, why is it that I do everything and I go through seasons where I can't seem to find my place? Because everything is my place. I'm called to raise you up which means I need to know a little bit about all of these seasons so that I can pour into your season. I can pour into your mantle because I know what it's like to carry it. But I got to be able to walk in the mantle that God has given me and I don't need to wear someone else's mantle that doesn't belong to me. And I need to be willing to take off the previous thing that gave me identity. But I look good in that one. See, that one kept me looking young. Let go of the things you had when you were young, but the hoodie looks so young. Let go of the things from your youth. When God wants to put a new mantle on you, he can't because it doesn't fit. You won't wear it right. But when you let God strip off the old things and you'll submit to an authority to speak into your life, it'll finally fit. And you can carry the supernatural power that God has called you to. The coat fits. It's what I'm called to carry the season. I need to let the Lord strip me down. And see, what you don't realize is that's the job of a father. The job of a father is to come up to you and say, stop it, take that off. Stripping hurts, correction hurts, discipline hurts, but the discipline will strip things off of you that you don't need to carry. It might have got you through the last season, but you're not called to carry it into the next season. Maybe it helped you in the last season, but it's not that season anymore. What happens is we don't know how to recognize the father we're supposed to be under. Can I give you a clue to that? What you're looking for is I'm looking for a good father instead of the father I'm called to. And you're not asking the Lord, Lord, where do you want me? You're looking for signs that everything about that father is perfect. And what happens is because of a past wound or a misunderstanding, you think that father has to be perfect to follow him. You know, one of the things I love about traveling with a ministry team is, is I always tell people, I say, when you travel with a ministry team, you will find out that each of us have spiritual BO. And you will minister with people who have spiritual BO, spiritual bad breath. And if you can minister with them after that, now you're family. I can tell you this, all of us that travel on trips regularly, all of us have seen all of us cranky. All of us have seen all of us in kind of a mood. Like, leave me alone. Oh my gosh, you're annoying me. Like, all of us. Because we're siblings. We're family. To stop them from fighting. All of us. And we continue to do ministry because ministry has never been about being perfect. But what we find out is that that is never the, the criteria for doing ministry together. We find out we're allowed to be human, pursuing. We're allowed to be imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. And so can I tell you, here, here's a great lesson in a father. The Bible says that Jacob he loved, but Esau he hated. Woo, that's strong verbiage. Jacob he loved, Esau he hated. And he passed a generational blessing. Isaac laid hands on Jacob and gave a generational blessing to Jacob that when he found out he was tricked, he couldn't take back. Inheritance belong to where they're given, period. It doesn't matter if the person uses them wrongfully, they belong to them. Be careful who you give inheritance. There is no taking back that stuff. We have this idea that we're not hirelings. Inheritance are not hirelings. When you give an inheritance, that's it. So Jacob takes the inheritance and it says that God takes him to go find a wife. And where does he take him to? A spiritual father. He takes him to another father. And he ends up working for Laban. And he works for Laban and it says that Laban tricks him. The first thing that Laban does is trick him. Ooh, man, you, some of you are not going to like this word. He tricks him and he gets him to marry the wrong girl because the older daughter really needed to be married first and he didn't have much hope for her. He doesn't love her. He loves Rachel. He doesn't love the, si the sister, but he marries the sister and he tricks him into staying longer than he's supposed to, supposedly supposed to, in order to also have Rachel. And so he is tricked. He's kind of thwarted at every turn. Laban doesn't really want him to be prosperous. He's, he's frustrated that everything that Jacob does is prosperous. I want you to get this. Laban is not a great spiritual father, yet somehow Jacob is more blessed under Laban than he was under his own father. 
You are a son. You're not looking for a perfect father. You're looking for the father you're called to be under. The fruit is your growing. So Jacob prospers under Laban. Everything he touches is great. And I want to say this. It's funny because Laban is not terrible. I, we paint this picture that Laban is terrible. Some of you are like, I've never read Laban, so I'm, he's good with me. Laban is not terrible because in the end, it finally, Jacob decides, we got to get away from your dad. This is a bunch of non, I'm done. I'm done with his antics. He's not terrible. He's not trying to kill Jacob or anything like that. He's just kind of a butt for a father. <laughs> Must be really. Some of you are like, I mean, my dad, he's a bit of a butt. He's not terrible. He's not great. But here's the truth. Jacob flees from Laban. They kind of get everything together and they just take off suddenly. They don't say a word. They just take off. They leave. And, and Rachel steals something from Laban. So Laban chases them down. He's like, mm, Jacob stole from me. I'm going to get him. And he shows up there and he searches everywhere. He doesn't find what was taken. And so he's like, so, so Laban's like, okay, all right, you didn't take anything. And what Laban says next gets me. Just paraphrasing. He says to him, he says, why, why did you just run away in the middle? Of, why did you just flee? Why didn't you at least let me bless you as you went? Why couldn't I bless you? Laban's desire was to send them with a blessing of the house. And they missed the opportunity to be blessed. They were still going to go, right? Because Laban wasn't, the, wasn't the, the, the forever father because of, because of how he's acting. But they, they were supposed to go with a blessing. There are so many people in the body of Christ who will say, well, that pastor or that church is a problem, so I'm going to flee. And you need to leave with a blessing of the house. It doesn't mean you're supposed to stay always, but you need to leave with the blessing of the house. Because what happens is in that moment, you go, oh, Laban wasn't as bad as I thought he was. Laban wasn't so much a problem. In fact, I'm going to propose something to you. Is it possible that the fact that Jacob had to stay and work for Rachel and didn't get her in the first, I think it was seven years, was good, that it was a blessing? Why? Because it says that everything Jacob touched under Laban's authority. All the sheep, all the lambs that Laban gave him for him to work were blessed under his authority. Year after year, he prospered under Laban. More years, more prosper. That he outgrew Laban because he stayed long enough to grow past Laban in the amount of wealth he carried. That he carried generational wealth because he stayed. And if he had only been there those seven years, he might not have got there. Because he honored a father who was not being the father he was supposed to be. But Jacob still stayed and honored his commitment. God blessed his hand. The way we honor will release our identity. But a lot of times what we do is we honor only what we see worth honoring. And we don't honor position. We honor a person. And I want to suggest to you that the biblical approach is that God is no respecter of people, but he is a respecter of position. And when we honor the position on someone, we activate their anointing over our life, their blessing and favor over our life, even if they need to get their act together sometimes. So stop thinking because you saw a flaw, that you saw a character flaw that they're working through that somehow that may, oh, God, show me that they're, they're corrupt, they're fake. They're, I'm not, and I, once again, I'm not talking about the spiritually abusive people. I'm not talking about the real stuff. That is, I'm not talking about the Sauls that are chasing you down, trying to kill you. David had to flee from Saul. He was trying to kill him. Different. If you're under a father that is trying to kill you, run. Don't be, show up and be like, hey, can you not spear me for a second because I need a blessing. That's different. I'm talking about those that just don't quite have their act together, but in the church, we are so quick to just run all the time instead of receive and honor so that, that something can come on our life from that and multiply us and teach us how to wear the right coats so that when it's our moment for God to take us and step out on that. But what we do is we want to get a little oil off someone and we're like, hey, I carry the oil. Come, come check out my ministry. Like people do that. And everyone's so quick to try to be completely grown up. They don't want to be sons and daughters anymore. Can I just tell you the truth? I am a son and I am a father, but I will never stop being either one. I will ne there are people that I'm a son to and there are people that I'm a father to. And I will never stop being either one. And when you start getting into the father position and you stop thinking you don't need to be a son or a daughter anymore, you get yourself in trouble. Because anywhere you are under authority, you have the favor of that genealogy under you. So when you are under authority, you have their genealogy attached. Amen? So what is it you need to let strip out of you tonight? What is it you need to let 
be released from you? What is it you need to step into? What coat do you need to pick up? This morning what I saw was a bunch of sons and daughters taking what they carry, taking what I poured out and using it effectively. Because what did I say? When you don't use it, it stagnates inside of you. And there's so many Christians, I see them all the time, they come up to get touched and it's like, what are you gonna do with it? I love you. You don't have to do anything with it. I still love you. You might not be ready to crawl yet. I don't know what phase of maturing and growth you are in. I don't know if you're still, you're still wearing diapers. Like I don't know the level of maturity you are at right now. Okay? So I'm not trying to get you to work before you're mature enough for that work. But if you're going to come get something, the question is, what are you going to do with what you've received? Are you in a season to mature it? Are you in a season to activate it? Are you in a season to uh, uh, ponder it deep in your heart until its season comes? Like, what is it you're going to take that oil that comes off someone onto your life? Are you going to do something with it? Or are you still in the season of going, hey, I'm still trying to understand. I'm still trying to learn. It's important that you're not just an oil junkie running around trying to get the gifts off another person's life. Want to see more healings? Who'd you pray for this week? I got a healing anointing. Tell me the last person you prayed for. Don't tell me about the healing anointing you got from me or Randy Clark. or I got this healing anointing and stuff, but I saw you walk right by that guy with a cane and you never even thought twice about praying for him. Who's the last person you prayed for? Well, I'm not ready to step out into that fully yet. Why not? Well, because that would require me doing stuff. But the next week at church, I see you running up for that healing anointing. I'm like, come. Why don't you try to use what you got? The worst thing I see in the body Christ is a shelf full of expired gifts. You're not gonna use them, you just collect them. We're not called to collect mantles. Some of you got a really big coat closet and it's like, what are you gonna do with that? You know, you don't wear a coat indoors, right? Like, like typically, you don't, you don't put a coat on in the living room. Like that's not, it's not, you put on a coat before you go. So the coat is there so you go. It's there for you to do something, okay? But here's what I wanna say. Your doing is not your identity, but your lineage is part of that. Your family is a part of that. And if you don't have one, you're missing a piece of your identity. Here's the most beautiful thing, I think. When God takes the children of Israel into the desert, he gives them an identity. He says, you're my people. I am your God and you are my people. You are my holy people, a royal priesthood. And then he gives them parameters of culture. He's like, do this, don't do this, don't do like they do over there. That's their culture, I want you to do this. And he gives them a culture so they can be identified as a people. And they, they have their own culture about them, their own identity, and it's beautiful. And I was at a meeting last night, Colette Toach, um, who I've followed for some time. We've been Facebook friends for a lot, while and talked a little bit. But she said something about that. She, she was saying that the Israeli people, that you know, her, her perspective was a lot of that stuff was so they had culture. I think it, culture was created out of that stuff, but I don't think it was just for culture but it was a really good perspective she had on that, that it identified them as a people. Oh, you, you don't eat pork? You, you guys must be Jews. Like it was an instant identifier. I think there was more to it than that, but it was an identifier for their culture. And it's like, what family you're attached to? When I look at your life, what tells me you're a part of the family? What family are you tied to? Can I see the family culture in you? Do you carry the name? Do you carry the culture? Or you just gonna say you attend. And that's okay if you say, well, I don't know if I wanna be tied to this family. You might, I mean, it's okay. Like, we a little wild bunch, okay? That's all right. You make your choice. Um, I went to that church. Um, it's a Pastor Marvelous's church. It was a marvelous church, honestly. Uh, Pastor Marvelous Church. And there, uh, he's African. He's from Kenya. So I got to practice my Swahili with him. And they have an African culture about their church. You know, it's like kind of a blended culture. But you, I'm like, oh yeah, I can feel all the African vibe in this, the African worship style and stuff, and dancing and all that kind of stuff. And, and they don't dance American appropriate. Like African cultures, you gotta have your booty out just a little bit. It's like, that's okay. I'm like, do your thing. Like, that's okay. They have a different, that different culture. Can I see the power on your life? Can I see the culture on your life? Do you look like the family? Do you want a pastor you like or you want a pastor you look like? Which one do you want? Because if you want a pastor you like, it means you've never given me authorization to speak into your life and bring correction. 
And if I can't bring correction because you need to like me, then I can't ever get you to where you're called to be. I don't need you to like me. I need you to look like me. It's like, I, there are some of you. I'm saying this tonight. Not why, because you're like, oh man, he's going to get on to us. No, I'm not. I see greatness in you. I see the plans and purposes of God on your life. And I want to speak into them. And I thank the Lord that I had a spiritual father in my life that would gripe me out. Ooh, Ren. I mean, like that. One time I remember he looked at me and he's like, maybe you don't need to be on the worship team anymore. And I said, well, maybe I don't. I was like, I'm sorry, I've misbehaved. And he chewed me out. And I was like, oh. I disappointed him. I didn't live up to his standard. I fell short and I let him down. And I realized I made him look like a bad leader. And I was like, it took, like a, it took me a few hours and I came back and said, I'm sorry. I won't do that again. You want to kick me off the worship team? I don't care. Like, I'm still sorry. Like, my apology is not to say I don't need to be on this worship team. I will sit down. I don't, I don't care. I said, I just, I'm sorry I disappointed you. And you, you've set a better example for me than that. And, and it was not one of those like, well, hey, Ren, do you think that maybe is the best practice? Do you think that's the best way to handle that? He was not, he was not short with words. I mean, he was not delicate with words. It was mm, like he was frustrated at me. And he had every right to be. And I'm so thankful I had someone in my life that was willing to be a father to me. And the truth is, when he chewed me out that day and then kept loving me after, I was drawn to him. That was probably the biggest time where I felt connected. And I'm like, man, I want you to be my father. Like, I pick you. I don't know if you know this, but I don't have a good father here. I don't have an earthly father that I can look up to, and you're probably it. And so for years, I asked him. I was like, you know, you're kind of a father. And he goes, no, no, Ren, I'm your friend. No, I'm just your friend. I'm just your friend. He goes, we're equals now. He goes, you know, at first it was like, I'm just your authority, but all that. But then afterwards, he's like, no, we're friends now. We're equals. He's like, Ren, in a lot of ways, you pass me. I'm like, you, you don't really pass your father, but it's different. And, and I, he would say for years he was a friend. Then I wrote my book. And he read my book, and he called me crying. And he says, I read your book. And he goes, I want you to know, I hope you don't have a rejection from me always saying I'm just your friend. And he goes, I, I do want to be a spiritual father. And I said, well, why are you always tell me no then? And he's like, because I don't feel like, every time you say that, I'm like, I feel like I'll fail you as a father. And I just want to stay friends so I don't have the responsibility he goes, because I see what's on your life and to father what's on your life feels very big to me. And he goes, I, I don't know that I have the ability to father you and I don't want to disappoint you. And I said, I don't need you to fix me. I don't need you uh, to be responsible for my calling. I just need you to love me. I need you to love me and believe in me and I need you to call me out on my garbage so I don't get off track. That's all I need. He's like, well, I could do that. I could do that. And that's when we entered into that. You need someone that will love you and believe in you and will call you out on your garbage so you can step into who you're called to be. You are not what you do. One last thing, I've said this before. When Jesus received the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Lord came in, into that place and said this, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. When the voice of God came to Jesus and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, he spoke identity, he claimed him, he named him, you belong to me, you're my son. And he said, in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus had never healed a leper. He was pleased. Jesus had never raised a dead man. He was pleased. Jesus had never preached a sermon. He was pleased. Jesus had never recruited disciples. He was pleased. Jesus had never done a day in ministry. He was called to go into ministry and save the world. He had never done a day of his assignment, yet God was pleased with him. God is not pleased with you because of what you do. He's pleased with you because of who you are. Your work 
and your identity are two different things. And as a church in this generation, in this season of a generation that's so confused on identity, they don't know who they belong to. They don't know who they are. They don't know their inheritance. They don't know where they're going. The church has to be the standard of where we're going, who we are. We have to know who we are. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And he's pleased with us. And we labor from his pleasure, not for his pleasure. We are not trying to get him to like us. He already loves us. He died for us before we did a thing. He gave his life to redeem us before we ever even messed up. Your identity is rooted in him. Your identity is rooted in your lineage. It's not rooted in your labor. But from who you are, you can live it out. You can do great and mighty things. And we raise people up in this house to walk in supernatural power and do things for the kingdom of God because of who they are. But if you're trying to get identity from the stuff you do, you've missed it. I don't need the best. I need family. I need sons and daughters that are like, hey, I'm in. I can love you. And even when I want to go, ooh, even when you go, oh, he doesn't see me. He doesn't see me. He doesn't see what I carry. I'm not interested in what you carry. I'm interested in you. My son just opened a second coffee shop. I helped him start it. We, we partnered together to open the coffee shop in Quail Springs Mall. Do, do you think I started a coffee shop with a 19-year-old because he's the most qualified candidate to run a business? He's doing a great job. Like, I'm so impressed. I'm like, dude, you're killing it. We're like, like just the, the level of professionalism he had has been amazing. Do you think that I picked him as a partner because he was the best businessman I knew to run this business? Did he get that opportunity because he was qualified or because he was my son? He has an inheritance from his father. He has his father's help. His father believes in him, and his father will promote him. His father will project him. His father will get underneath him and lift him up, and his father will raise him up into identity. I will help him raise him up into identity because I'm his father, not because he's the best candidate. That's what's available when you have a church that understands family. Not potluck social life. Family. Identity. Inheritance. And lineage. There will be people that rise up out of this house that will be like, I'm a son and a daughter of Pastor Ren Shufflin. Not I was trained up in their ministry school. Yes, some of you will go, I went to their ministry school. Isaiah Shuffman is a son of Ren Shuffman. He went to Global Awakening. He spent three years in Randy Clark's ministry school. That is his pedigree of education. So you know what he knows. Oh, okay, you're trained up in the supernatural stuff. You know that. He is not a son of Randy Clark, though. He carries a spiritual inheritance from Randy Clark, and he's a part of that lineage. But he's a son of Ren Shuffman. And there's something, there's something that comes from that level of sonship you step into. Each one of those levels offers something different. It opens different doors. It gives different opportunities. And it celebrates who you are. It comes alongside of you and aids what you're called to do. And there's something about each one of those. When someone goes, oh, okay, well, you were trained at Randy Clark. It's like, sure. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay. There's a different level of opportunity that comes with that authority that you're under. And the honor you give to those authorities in your life. You can honor a lot of authority. You need to be careful what coat you wear. These are spiritual principles. When you, care, you be careful, but you, need, but you need to be attached to somebody. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you're st you, you came out of slavery. God set you free, but you're still a wanderer. And you're not really connected or rooted to anything. And you're just wandering around. And, you're, and you have the mentality of, I'm on my own, nobody's for me. Man, you gotta, there are people that will be for you. You've got to let someone be for you. You can't do it alone. It will not happen. And what happens is, is the enemy is real good at letting you pick some bad people to partner with so that you will never partner again. 
If he can just get some bad people in your face, maybe he can keep you out of the best places for you. Don't let past wounds keep you from putting on the identity you're called to carry now. Carry that identity. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for a church that lives out their identity, that because they know who they are, they can be who they're called to be. Because they know what they carry, they can be what they're called to be. Because they're in a house, a family that carries power. Father, would you help them to look like the family? Would you help them to grow up in the culture of the family and carry the family identity and the family inheritance? If you are visiting us tonight and you are part of a church where you don't want to look like the leadership, maybe you ain't in the right place. If you are in a place, if you're in a church, if you're visiting us and you're in a church where you want to look like the leadership, dig in. Dig in. Make them have to adopt you. Father, right now, would we have a spirit of adoption just available in this room tonight? Would we carry the identity of the kingdom? And Lord, would, would we be the kind of people that wouldn't just want to be accepted in the family, but would be open to receiving new people in the family? That we would have an open policy to saying more sons, more daughters, and no competition mindset of feeling like we've lost our place with dad. But Father, we want to grow the family, grow the culture, and see the kingdom go from a family to a kingdom. Would we carry the authority of the family business, the king of kings, the Lord of lords? Because my family is not one that's powerless. My family is not one devoid of the signs and wonders and miracles. My family... I have an inheritance through my father who's the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills whose hand is not short and treasure is not small. And I am in the family of inheritance. I'm a part of a kingdom and I'm part of a local tribe, a local family that is attached to that kingdom. And so father, will we be a people that carry that authority? Lord, I thank you I thank you. Help us to strip off, to consecrate the giftings and the coats you've given us, the callings on our life, Lord. Let us first strip off the old Jesus carried what he received from the Holy Spirit and he went into the wilderness and he fasted and prayed. He let go of his last identity as a carpenter and became a king. Let us take off the old coat and put on the new one that Jesus has for us, that God has given us, and let us consecrate it by the stripping of our lives. Let us not be afraid to be correctable people. Let us not be afraid to be stripped. Let us take off the things that are hindering our ability to wear what we're called to in this season, to be who we're called to in this season. Time to unzip the last coat time to put on the new. So Father, would you just put a mantle of authority on us tonight, Lord, that this church will be known as a church that carries authority. This church will be known that carries the heart of God and the love of God. This church will be known to be the active church, not for identity, from identity. Father, you would raise us up. Let us be people that understand family, that with a father, we can go farther. The father keeps us safe. Lord, I thank you that you're releasing old identity. See, some of you just need to let that go right now. Come on, that's the altar call, is let it go. Let go whatever you carried in. Let, it, let, let go of that broken identity that was given to you. Let go of the identity that was given to you that was wrong. Let go of the identity that someone that was supposed to love you was false. David's brother saw a shepherd boy, but God saw a king. You need to, you need to let God define your identity and surround yourself with people that will call out that identity. David had a Nathan who called out his identity and didn't let him slip back into a problem child. Father, would you just surround us by people that will call us to identity and call us to account when we're not walking in it, when we're not being who we're supposed to be. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, 
Holy Spirit, would you just come? And for those that go, I don't know who I am in Christ. I don't know who I'm supposed to be. Lord, would you just help us to understand who we're called to be? No going back, no shrinking, but to pick up your shoulders, stand tall and say, I know who I am in Christ. To be who God has called you to be and walk in it in humility. Perfect humility. Being exactly who God has called you to be. Nothing more, but nothing less. So Father, would you put us in our place tonight? Would you cover us with your coat tonight? Would you put our identity in us tonight? Would you allow us to look like you? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what I'm asking for tonight. Follow me as I follow Christ. They're not following Christ. They're not, you're not following them. Father, give us the identity of the kingdom tonight. Would you just pour it out on us, Father? And right now, I feel like some of you, you're shredding off old identities and you're just taking off those coats and you realize that right now I can't fit the coat on. God's given me this coat, but I've, every time I try to put it on, I'm just reminded what I'm wearing underneath it. I'm just re reminded of the words that I'm still wearing. I'm reminded of the trauma I'm still wearing. I'm reminded of the hurtful things I went through and experienced. I'm still wearing. I'm reminded of the places where I failed in my own life. I'm still wearing. I'm reminded of the time that I didn't live up to my expectation and I I'm the problem. I remember when I was the problem and I'm still wearing that coat. You need to take it off so you can put on your new one. It's time for that to come off and for you to forgive those that hurt you and forgive, those, forgive yourself for hurting you. Where other people were a stumbling block, let that go. Where you were a stumbling block, let that go. You blew it, so what? Get up, fight again. Win. You're not called to lay down and die except die to yourself. You're called to resurrect. So die to that old identity and be raised in a new one. Come on, some of you accepted Christ and you were spiritually reborn, but you've never let go of that old identity. Right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. You are not what you came out of. Some of you need to get this. Father, would you just let them know they are not what they came out of. You are not Egypt. You are not your previous sin. You are not your previous falling. God has a plan for your future. He's a promise on your life. And you need to lock arms with promise carriers because they'll take you into promised places. When you are part of the family, you walk into the promise with them. So Father, would you make us a church full of promise carriers and people that walk into promise together. And Lord, let no one stand outside the promise. We walk into the fire of God and some people stay outside and they miss the promise. Let us carry the identity of the kingdom and walk into promise together. I don't want anyone to miss it. It breaks my heart that some do. But Lord, thank you for those that will chase it. Thank you for those that will march into it. Thank you for those that will lock arms and say you're not my, you're not just my fighting companion, you're family. And I'll fight for you. Thank you, Lord. No greater love than this that a man should lay down his life for a friend. Lord, that we carry each other's burdens, that we are the bearers. That we're in it together. You are not alone. Some of you, you came in tonight and you're like, I feel alone all the time. Stop standing on the outside. Come in. Let go. Put on the new coat. There's an identity for you here. Lord, thank you. So, Father, I ask, as they take that coat off, you just strip away every broken or wrong identity that they carry. And you put on them a new coat, a coat of many colors, a coat of the house, a coat of the kingdom. Father, 
They're all part of the army, but they're also a part of this elite fighting force here. So they can carry your army coat, but they get a badge from us. So Father, right now, Lord, I commit as they put on that coat that we're going to train them, raise them, equip them, love them, send them, stand behind them, and correct them, and care for them. I'll tell them what they need to stop, but I'll also tell them what they need to start. Lord, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for these that you've given me. Help me to be a good shepherd to them, a good father, a good apostle, a good leader. And Lord, even in the places where I labor, where I don't quite give them what they've asked me for, I don't see what they need. Lord, would you prosper them even so as they honor? Would you double would you give them more? Would there be increase on their life? Would you prosper the work of their hands so that people will see they are a blessed people? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this church, for these mighty men and women of God that are called, and in this place, they'll be chosen because we're going to do the work between the calling and the choosing to get to the choosing. And you're called, but few are chosen. In this house, we're going to see a lot of chosen. So I'll fight to make you chosen. You'll either grow or you'll go. That's the only way it'll happen. So Father, root them deep so they can grow big, so they can grow fruitful. Lord, I thank you. Holy Spirit, just birth new gifts in them. And let us better steward and help them to steward the giftings on their life. And let us grow the kingdom through them, Lord. I thank you for those that have come in and said, this is home. We're going to build generational inheritance out of it. That'll be blessed to a thousand generation. And so for every place where you're still carrying the trauma, the hurt, the lack, the poverty of a third and fourth generational curse, Lord, I just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke demonic assignments over your life to hinder your promise. Every promise that's been bound up must be released right now in the name of Jesus. As you release the coat of its authority on your life, take off the coat of less. Take off the coat of poverty. Take off the coat of spiritual abuse. Take off the coat of being unseen and overlooked. Take off that coat. Some of you need to see yourself. Take it off. And so, Father, as they take it off, I put on them the kingdom identity that they are righteous, they are the head and not the tail, they are above and not beneath, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing, not lacking, not empty. Empowered, supernatural, children of the Most High God, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, set apart. Not rejects and not slaves. not invisible but they're loved for who they are so Lord would the love of God just sweep over some of them that need that tonight Lord I thank you for your love I thank you for a godly inheritance in this house I thank you that this house carries an inheritance of prophecy an inheritance of words of knowledge an inheritance of healing beyond all the signs and wonders and miracles of inheritance here. Lord, let this be a house where we learn to love. Where it can be said that those people loved Jesus and loved others. And they demonstrated that with the miracles. I 
can't war for all of you all the time. But all of you can war for all of you all the time. Each of us warring for each other. Each of us praying for each other. Each of us reaching out for those each other. We can all do it together. One half to the other and the other half to the other. We can do it together. I can't do it by myself. I need some siblings to be responsible for their brothers and sisters. I need some older brothers and sisters that will mentor their younger siblings. Dad can't be there 24-7. He's working. But we can do it together as a family. So, Father, let us be united as a family, Lord. Let that happen, Lord. I'm so grateful that I'm preaching to the choir tonight. I just, Lord, I wanted to take this out of the subconscious and into the conscious. Because we do it well, but sometimes we need to do it consciously. So, Father, I thank you. Lord, you stayed up and prayed all night long and said, who should I pick from amongst them? And you singled out out of your disciples those you call close to you. Lord, let us have those relationships. And Lord, let us not be so wounded by our past that we, are, we, we see overseen or overlooked because one picked another over us. One got closer than the other one. Lord, no, the kingdom of God is not about competition. We're all family. going to be a house of legacy. Thank you, Lord. Why am I preaching this now? Because we're about to see people come in these doors. We're about to see floodgates open up and people come in. Man, they need to be met by family. And so if you guys have this in your conscious mind, when people flood in here, you're like, look at that. New adoptions. And you won't look at them like visitors. They're people looking for a family. They're looking to be adopted in the kingdom. We're not going to send them back to the orphanage, are we? Man, they're orphans. Some of you in this room, you came in here tonight, and you're orphans. You don't know where you belong or who you're connected to. If we're not it, find it. I, I went to Marvelous's churches, and I walked in there, and I found a family that had vis it's been with, that visited us for maybe a month or so. She, she's great. Some of you know her. She's... She's, she's an African woman, and she brought her husband. Did, didn't quite feel like a fit for him. Where did they land? A church with an African pastor with a whole bunch of African flavor, and they're like, oh, this is my culture. And so she saw me, and she got all excited. And you could tell, though, there's a little bit like, oh, I went to your church for like a month, and now I'm not going. And this is where we fellowship. And she like waited for my response. And I'm like, I am so glad. And I said, you know, it kind of makes sense why you landed here. And she goes, right? And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, that's awesome. I'm glad you found the place where you fit. I'm glad you found family. And she's like, oh, I'm coming to your ministry school. And I'm like, cool. And I'm like, you, you're okay. I came tonight to, to worship with you guys. This is family too. Last night, something amazing happened went to this meeting and I was just there to meet Colette for the first time instead of just be Facebook friends. And I just went by myself because I'm an investigate. So I didn't post it or anything. Next time. And at the end, Marvelous asked all the pastors, the apostles, to get up and instead of Colette just praying over the altar, he asked all of us to get up and start praying. So there's five of us there. Me and James Fortune from uh, Oasis in Edmond, and uh, Jeff Capuria, who's preached here, and his wife, Heather, uh, and Chris Johnson, who was the pastor at Abide Church. Not anymore, but... And we all started praying over the altar. And you know how I do. I'm like, there's an altar call. Let the bodies hit the floor. And I started praying. And you know what happened? No bodies hit the floor. And I'm praying. I'm like, they're receiving something, but I'm like, no body. And I, you don't need to fall down for me. To, like, but, but I noticed it was abnormal. It was the normal thing. I don't care if you fall down. But I was like, okay, what's going on? And so the Lord spoke to me. He said, have James pray with you for this one. I said, James, come here. Come here. Lay hands with me. 
And he came over and he touched her. And the power of God hit her and she went out. I said, we got to do this together. And so there Jeff was praying for someone. And they were kind of receiving, but they weren't. And I went over there. She has her eyes closed. She don't know. And I grabbed her other hand. And when I did, the power of God hit her. She went out. So I went over and grabbed that one. That one was praying for that one. I went and helped to touch. And they looked at me like, go, go ahead. And I said, no, 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 no. This is us, not me. And, I, and so I started praying. I said, watch this. So I told them, I said, watch. And I started praying for this one. She didn't receive it. And I said, come lay hands. And so Jeff came over there and he went, fire God. And, she, and I was like, it's us, not me. I said, there's a spirit of unity. God is trying to break disunity in the, in the shepherds. We ask the sheep to unite, but the shepherds don't. It's ridiculous. So I was like, this is the spirit of unity. Where there's been division, there'll be unity tonight. And God is breaking open floodgates where he says, you're not going to do it without your brother at your side. And so we prayed together. And we went down and we laid hands together. And anyone that wasn't quite receiving, uh, they saw it, they, they'd run over and they'd lay hands with us. They didn't take over, they just did it together. And everyone in that room got touched. And all of a sudden, what turned into us praying and nobody, I mean, we were praying for maybe five minutes and everyone was still standing in line waiting on Colette to get to them, right? And I'm like, okay, they're trying to resist because they want, they want the speaker to pray. That's normal. And then when we started praying, she didn't have nobody to pray for anymore because we came together. So we're a family in this place, but the body of Christ is a family here in Oklahoma City and God did something miraculous and we bonded together and I was like, that was exciting. We need to be together. We need to be partnered, guys. So this morning at 10, 18, before I got up to preach, I didn't see it till afterwards. I had a message from James and he was like, whoa, praying for fire to come on your church today. And I said, I prayed for you in my service. <laughs> And I'm like, man, I'm praying, God, don't just do it here. I prayed it for the mic this morning. Lord, I hope what's happening here is not just happening here. I hope it's happening in Edmond at James's church. I hope it's happening at Marty's church. I hope it's happening at all the churches that are together in unity as a family. And God is bringing them together. And I saw something. I saw the spirit of division lose its grip on our city. And I saw revival start to hit. And so what happened this morning was a byproduct of what you never saw last night. And it was not created by me, fed by me, or seated by me. It happened when others in this room said, let's do something for Jesus. Let's pray. It was not manufactured and it was not an excitement by me. I never preached it. Something broke last night over our city when five pastors came together and said, let's pray together. Instead of going up and down the aisle to see who was more anointed, ha ha ha, you dropped one, but I dropped 14. I don't know if you know this, but I'm the biggest apostle in the room. That happens. Five ministers all of a sudden get it Get a, get a prayer line and it's like let's see who can do more there's a thing that happens shouldn't it does <laughs> but God was like no you guys are going to do it together or you're not going to do it and in this season God is saying you're either going to partner together as a family or you're not going to do it that's why this message is so crucial tonight because he withheld the anointing last night until we did it together and he told me I'm, no no you your brothers right there lay hands together call the elders not just one lay hands together so in this season god's going to hold it back unless we partner together so whatever you're what you have identity but there's a calling on your life and your calling will require you to see your brother and your sister and partner with them amen if your calling is you sized it's not god sized if you can do it by yourself, it's not from the Holy Spirit. It's from your spirit. It's from your flesh. Everything God has called you to do will require a partnership, vulnerability, and to make yourself accessible to wounds. Call to wear a coat, not armor yourself from your brother. Some of you, God has called you to partner with your brother and sister in ministry, and you go get fully armored to protect yourself from them. And you, show, and you wonder why you get in fights with them because you look like you're ready for a fight. Father, will we be partners? Would we be together? Would we be unified? I thank you, Lord. I thank you for those you've called here. I thank you for those you haven't called here. I thank you for the families around the city that are partnered together, that will see the work of the kingdom as we come together. I thank you that there's a spirit of unity because we know who we are and we're rooted in that and we don't have to compete for love. We don't have to compete to be loved. And because of that, we can be rooted in you. In the name of Jesus.
we want to pray for you. Send us a message with your prayer requests through Facebook or email and let us know how we can pray for you today. Also, let us know how this message impacted your life. I love you. God loves you. Shalom. Shalom.